Bum 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 bum. Bum 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 bum. Hey everybody. Hey, hey. Andrew and Scott here. You're probably wondering why we're together. Well, me and Scott, our families have this vacation every year that we do together here in beautiful Destin, Florida. Mm -hmm. So we are together this week quarantining it up and enjoying the beach. And uh, we thought since we're together, we'd go ahead and intro this super special Veritox episode uh, with Annie Dupree. She yeah. is a member of the Annie Moses Band, amazing singer. And uh, actually the first time we got to see her, um, we were both still in college, University of Mobile, and uh, Annie Moses Band came to our school, performed, and it was, it was one of the most inspiring and amazing uh, concerts that I've I've ever been to. It was yeah. just awesome. Yeah, and Annie's uh, she's the lead singer of mm -hmm. Annie Moses Band, which she is predominantly all her family. We talk a little bit about that in the interview, but um, she she sings and she's also an incredible violinist, uh, trained at Juilliard. Um, has just extensive background in classical music, but they, the whole family uses their background to cross over into other arenas, and it's just a wonderful sound that they that they produce, and very creative, very, um, very unique uh, to sound like I've never heard before. And um, James and I actually got to sit down with Annie this week uh, for this interview, and we really think you're going to enjoy it a lot. So. Would you welcome our guest for Veritas this week, Annie Dupree? So Veritas gets a lot of a lot of people that don't quite know how to pronounce our name, and a lot of people want to know <laughs> why we're called Veritas, and so we're explaining that a lot. I have a feeling that you guys run into that, especially your name's Annie. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming most people think your last name is Moses. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, that's, yes, very correct. So tell yeah. us a little bit about the name and where it comes from. Sure. Um, well, I'm named after my great grandmother, who mm -hmm. was Annie Moses. Um, and when we started our group as a family, we began tracing not only our lineage as a family, but just our musical lineage as a family and yeah. Yeah. Um, how, how God had really uniquely used people uh, in pivotal times and places to uh, craft a trajectory for our family that had to do with music and had to do with faith. And that really began with Annie Moses. And so um, seeing as I was the lead singer of the band um, and the oldest of the six siblings that were going to comprise the band, um, there was a lot of synergy behind that name. Yeah. And so we decided to be, to call ourselves Annie Moses band after her. That's so fun. Cool. And you, Literally, you probably have to say that every time after a show. Yeah, we, we pretty much never do a show where that doesn't get told. It was funny because I, you know, it was already a little bit confusing because, um, you know, being Annie Moses is my, my mother's mother's mother, right? So it's all maternal. So yeah. because of that, none of us have ever been Moseses, right? Because mm. right. it was all lost through the marriages. So we grew up Wooliver's, right? That's our last name. Okay. Uh, our parents are Bill and Robin Wooliver. Mm -hmm. And so we were the Wooliver family that became the Annie Moses Band. And then when I got married, I became Annie Dupree. And that was just like triple levels of confusion. Sure, yeah, of course. <laughs> so now I'm just Annie of the Annie Moses Band yeah, because I, a lot more easy for people to understand. Yeah, we totally get that. We have to, we have to tell everybody every night, every show, it's... Veritas. It's not Veritas. It's not, <laughs> it's not Veritas because that's some kind of disease, I'm sure. <laughs> but we have to go through that. So we totally understand what that is like, you know. Yeah. So for all of our wonderful friends who are watching this <laughs> now, this is Annie Dupree of the Annie yeah. Moses Band. <laughs> when in doubt, just say Annie and I will answer. There you go. I remember the first time I heard the Annie Moses Band, I was a freshman in college, which was a little bit ago. And <laughs> I just remember being completely blown away by the level of talent. Thank that you. Is, and, your, and the band is made up of all of your family, siblings, or are your mom and dad in it too? Or? Yeah, my mom and dad are very involved. Um, 
We lost oh, your yeah. video, Annie. Oh, yes. there you go. I'm back. Uh, yeah, my parents are very involved. Um, and yes, yeah, so it's my six siblings mm -hmm. and then my parents. Um, we've got a drummer uh, that's not, um, not you know, family, sure. um, but we've known him a long time. Yeah. And then we also have um, my brother-in-law plays bass and guitar for us. His name is James De Silva. Nice. Um, you know, with any band, there's sort of... Um, I don't want to call it client, you know, changes that happen in the configuration, yes. but changes do happen. Yeah. Um, my sister Camille, for instance, has been off the road for about hmm, probably three years now and just had her third baby, you know, so she, wow. you know, there's just family things that happen that right. you yeah. have to, you know, make adjustments for. Yeah. And so when those adjustments have needed to be made, we've just made them. Um, my parents aren't on the road all the time anymore. Um, they're on and off. Um, yeah. So it just changes depending upon the season and what has to happen with our families now that many of us are married and have children of our own. Yeah. But um, anyway, the family story and who we are creatively is still very much intact in terms of when and how and why we create music. Yeah. As the lead singer, do you kind of lead the creative charge or is that more of a collaborative thing between all of you? Like, how does that work? It's very collaborative. Um, you know, I think we are kind of, I don't know, I think I like our collaborative process. Mm -hmm. We are very, we have a lot of strong opinions. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of equally strong Hello. opinions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, but we all like each other, which is really helpful because you can just say, you know, I love this song, but I hate that chord. So we gotta figure that out, you know? Yeah. And, <laughs> and at the end of the day, you can just say, you know, that's okay. Yeah. And that's actually something we've talked a lot about as a family because, you know, probably next to who is Annie Moses, my next uh, most frequently asked question is, so what's it really like being uh. a family? <laughs> you know, there's always that, uh, mm -hmm. where's the, the dirt, you know? Yeah. And, and I understand why, because there's a very long, lineage of family bands that always have you know the skeleton in the closet or the thing that really didn't work or the people that were really hurt by being in music yeah mm -hmm. and so much of what we have um, i mean we we just pray about it a lot as a family is just the fact that the most important thing to us is not that we make music together it's that we are family you mm -hmm. know and that we have yeah. capacity of just being family, of just yeah. getting together and having Thanksgiving and it not having to be a social media moment, not having to be yeah. songwriting session, not yeah. having to be something else. Um, and that can be hard when you're in the business of music because you have to draw hard boundaries that yeah. are, you know, this is family time. Yeah. Right. And this is work time. Right. And, and finding that balance. Yeah. But I think create on a creative level, um it is very collaborative more so now uh than it ever has been just because yeah. so many of us um are well so many of us i say that sounds like me i i actually feel kind of the least um i like collaborative songwriting but like my younger sibling jeremiah and gretchen are just incredible songwriters so you guys you guys tour quite a bit um you record you, you you're constantly putting out new projects um and a wide variety of projects too i know you're involved in teaching at a lot of different levels and all that so tell us just a little bit about as as a whole there's a lot under the umbrella what are some of those moving parts underneath the umbrella of the annie moses band yeah well we are unique in the sense that um we have not for quite some time, we have not considered our central mission just making music mm -hmm. in the make an album, play a concert. Sure. We love that part, yeah. um, particularly the touring part. I mean, we really thrive off of the concert. Um, yeah, sure. And I think part of that's because Annie Moses Band has always existed in a very unusual space. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Veritas knows a little bit yeah. in this sense that, you know, the the business infrastructure of Nashville is very um, is very suited toward Christian music being um, somewhat myopically defined yeah. and somewhat monochromatically defined. Narrow. Yes, you know yeah. that Christian music is should be defined by its content, 
And for them, it's not just defined by content, it's defined by style. Mm -hmm. And the style is, generally speaking, rock male vocals, basically. Yeah, exactly <laughs> what you do. Play. I know. Don't I look like a rock male vocalist? I just, I just, exactly. Um, so there's, we've always kind of had this unusual place where um, God kind of has one, one foot planted over here in the world of faith and Christendom yeah. and another foot planted over here in the world of the arts, yeah. the arts market where it's, it's theaters and it's, mm -hmm. um, just a lot more classicism within right. the part of what we do musically. Yeah. So, uh, that's been in some ways a hard place to stand, but in other ways, a very, um, probably in other ways, our greatest success because yeah. people love the uniqueness and the freshness of what it is. Yeah. But everywhere we went to travel and perform, we found that people wanted to know our family story right. and they wanted to know essentially why my parents had determined that they were going to invest in their children's musical mm -hmm. uh, talents to such an Olympic level. You know, yeah. it was, there are just very few families that decide they're going to move their kids across America to study at places and do the things that my parents did. And so people derived a lot of inspiration from that, from the idea that a family and that parents in particular can commit themselves to their children in that way. And the idea that music is a spiritual discipline, the idea that our excellence is an offering to God. Yes. So all of those, uh, kind of philosophical and spiritual talking points and um, that we felt so deeply became the foundation of what became our mission really as, as a family um, beyond just making music. And that was to help raise up a new generation of young artists mm. who would be equally committed to excellence in their craft, yeah. but also deep rooted in their faith. Mm. Um, you know, we live in a world, we, we kind of feel this even more so in the middle of this pandemic, that the fact that the world lives on this device, right? This little device here. Yeah. <laughs> the world is the device. Yeah. And, and unless you have, um, unless you plan as a creator that you are going to fill the device, mm -hmm you don't have the opportunity to speak into the imaginations of your culture. Yeah. So really for us, that has taken shape in a lot of different ways. Um, the first was that many years ago before the pandemic and before the iPhone, we had a program called the Annie Moses summer music festival. Yeah. And that was basically just this you know, big tense two week event. We had about yeah. 200 kids that would come from all over for that. Yeah, And then after that, we had people that started asking if they could come and like study with us more in depth. Yeah, And yeah. so out of that grew what we call the Conservatory of Annie Moses. And that's very much an artist development program. So we, yeah. we teach everything from songwriting to music production, to singing, to classical violin, to fiddle, to violin, to guitar. Mm -hmm. And it's about, Oh, a little under a hundred folks that are a part of that. And they come from like seven different states. You know, people oh. travel from Michigan, and Oklahoma and Missouri and Florida, oh. and Georgia and mm -hmm. far places because it's, I mean, y'all are very well studied. Yourself. And it's very, a lot of times music programs are kind of either like classical or. Yeah. Yes. Right? And nothing. Very yeah. Very divided. And it's very hard to say even if you are like incredibly well-trained, mm -hmm. nobody sits around and tells you how you're going to make a living at your craft. Right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know? They just kind of say, here's your training and go out into the world. <laughs> <laughs> Figure it out. So yeah. true. Uh, and so uh, people come a great way in order to kind of find the, the melding of that. Um, yeah. Not just, and not even just from a, I have chops now, how do I use them? But from yeah. how do I use them for the kingdom? That's yeah. even a whole other level of um, hard to find. Yeah. So we conservatory, we have our festival. Um, and then we have what is it, the most 
exciting to me right now is that we're kind of in the season where we have the chance to reap the harvest of what we've sown for the last mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years yeah. with a lot of these students. Um, our, our first young artist, a, a young lady named Emma Borders, she's 14 years old, mandolin prodigy, plays mm -hmm. incredible songwriter. She just um, has been out on the road with Josh Turner before mm -hmm. all of, you know, nice. uh, some yep. shows got canceled. And yep. so right now we're starting to actually launch artists. Um, yeah. we're, we're refilming a brand new kids TV show. Um, nice. So it's just nice. unique things like that, that in our mind are part of our mission to create all kinds of products. Yeah. Um, I don't even say, products, I guess just offerings yeah. and best ourselves in people that will eventually create their own offerings right? Yeah. so that we can impact this world through these platforms. Yeah. Yeah. I think so many times musicians are prone to want to hold on to what they've learned because it gives them some sort of some sense of identity, but it also is like, well, if I let go of this, then someone might take it from me yeah. and, you know, I, my success might drop because of it or whatever. But learning how to like, like what you said, offering and, and letting what you've learned passing that along to younger people to young, and, and even older people just mm -hmm. in the spirit of, of the arts are to be shared, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not hoarded for ourselves. You know, yeah. I just think that's so cool that y'all are, that y'all are doing that. And, and the way that you're um, letting it flow out of the mission of mm -hmm. Annie Moses band, you're not trying to be someone or anybody that you're not as a band. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's important because honestly, it's hard to be somebody else. If you've ever, <laughs> if, you ever if you've ever tried to be somebody uh, else for a day, or well, or, for sure. I mean, it it and artists, I think, really struggle with that, you know, because a lot of times, I mean, that's why Michael Jackson happens, because mm -hmm. at some point there was somebody in his life that projected a falsified version of himself. And yes. that falsified version became so big and so glorious and so right. famous that who he was as a person had to be subsumed yeah. by the, the, the creature that was made. Right. Yeah. And that's why I think the arts can be such a, such a pitfall. Sure. You no, know, because unless you have, um, unless you can just really, you have to just walk in humility <laughs> and, yeah. and not, and not that I'm the most, I, I, I don't even say that like I'm the most humble person, but I just think that it's, it's hard. You know, we follow, we follow in the footsteps of a man who said, I make myself I, a man of no reputation, yeah. make myself of no reputation. Yeah. And in the industry we're in, right. The way that we, uh, calculate success is how many likes did that get? How many people saw that video? How many people yeah. subscribed to my YouTube channel? How many people downloaded that on Spotify? How many? <laughs> and so that is a constant. Um, I find my own heart in constant check. Yeah. Okay. Those are not the definers of my success. They're not the definers so of my good. success. That is so good. Scott, it's hard. I would Scott and I were talking right before you hopped on just about why musicians get into music. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of, a lot of people get into music as, as kids mm -hmm. and some people use it as a way of expressing themselves. Mm -hmm. and some people use it as a way to establish some sort of identity or to garner attention or affection that is, is needed, but isn't getting met and, and, whatever ways you know i mean i know for myself when i first started in music it was because the applause mm -hmm. was so alluring to me mm -hmm. and i wasn't necessarily singing from a place of authenticity like you're saying being yourself mm -hmm. i was trying to garner attention mm -hmm. and that's been a hard thing to try to keep in check you know well, I think that it's hard. Yeah, goodness. The 
the motivations of the heart are very difficult to determine because there's a part of performance that's not evil inherently right. like the joy of having people applaud for you or the joy of feeling that you've done something well sure. um is not inherently something wrong in fact i think it's probably built upon the fact that at the beginning of time god looked at what he had created and he said behold it is good yeah right, right? god in and of himself wanted to affirm the thing that he had created yeah. and every person that creates longs to do that you long to listen back to the take and go yeah, I nailed that. That was yeah. great. You know, and I don't think that that's something inherently evil, but I do think that it's something that, uh, that Satan manipulates the longing to be loved by man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, I don't know if y'all have read, uh, C.S. Lewis's, um, essay called the weight of glory. I've seen it quoted so many times, but I've never read it. You totally, every, every musician artist needs to read this one. But, you know, the whole idea is that the word glory comes from the Greek word doxa, mm-hmm. which means weight. Mm-hmm. And so it's the same word, like if you've seen the, the lady that's at, like the little statue, you know, and on one scale, you yeah. know, she's the scales that they use as economic. Yeah, exactly. And that weight, like, the weight is that yeah. same word also like how yeah. much is this way and i think that um we weren't meant to carry the weight of glory mm. it's and when you when we do that when we when mankind glorifies a person mm. um we put a weight on them that a lot of times mm. we just we can't yeah. we weren't meant to sustain that and i think that's why Whitney Houston happens. And that's why, that's why you kind of look at these people and you say, Oh, that's not going to end well. Yeah. (laughs) And you know it from the beginning, you know, that's not going to end well. Um, and you can kind of choose to walk in that or not walk in it. Yeah. Um, But it's, it's a hard thing. I know for me, I think so much of the reason why I'm in music is very much my mother. You know, it's the fact that from the time I was a little bitty girl, five and six years old, you know, my mom got up every day and practiced with me and said, you know, I'm going to, my mom was a great singer and my mom was beautiful and my mom was young and my mom had written hit songs, but she wasn't spending her time doing those things. Mm -hmm. She was spending her time with me because she said, there's a greatness in you that I'm responsible for and I love you and I'm going to help you find it. And when that happens for years and years, you build this, there's this, this barrel of love that gets connected with your music, you know, so that when you make music together, it's a love language between the Mm. people that see on stage and that, and that can then overflow to the audience. Yeah. Because what you hope happens, you know, because then it's about, um, you know, using the skill that you've u- garnered with your brain <laughs> to connect to your heart to mean something for people when they sit in the chair. Yeah, totally. You mentioned the kind of going back to Genesis one and God saying that it's good and and affirming what is good. I was actually just this morning listening to a podcast um, that was kind of talking about that same concept, mm-hmm. um, and it's. Uh, podcast called the Bible project, two guys, Tim Mackey and John Collins, and they just deep dive into theology. And it's fascinating to me. Um, But they were talking about that phrase, and how you see almost the same phrase happen again, um, in the garden with the serpent, but it's flipped on its head, where the serpent says, take and eat of this, it's good. Mm -hmm. But you're taking it. it, it's something good, and you're taking it in for yourself. Mm, you flip right. it back into Genesis 1, God is saying, this is good, and I'm giving it all to you. Yeah. Um, and so it's a direct, it, it's this, you know, uh, literary figure that's being used yeah. to show a direct opposition to what was originally intended. And it's great to affirm all that is good, and then to give of yourself and to give of what is good to everyone else is exactly what God did. But our tendency is to see something that's good and then take it for ourselves. Take the applause. Take yes. The glory. Take the honor for whatever happened. I One thing that I love about the Annie Moses band is how philosophically rich it is. There's, there's in every aspect of what y'all do, the philosophy behind why you do it is very apparent. 
yeah. um, which I have a lot of respect for. And yeah. so I'm curious to know in, in like your conservatory efforts and through the Annie Moses Foundation, the things that you're doing in training younger artists, what are ways that y'all help instill, not even instill your same philosophy, but get them to think about what is my artistic philosophy? What is the why behind what I'm doing? Um, what, what are some ways that y'all instill that thought process and not just the excellence of their craft? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, probably the primary way is uh, my brother Benjamin teaches a class called Creativity and the Creator, mm -hmm. um, which actually I'm really excited about. We um, spent quite a bit of time last semester filming that whole um, Mm -hmm. set of study um, mm -hmm. he has a degree well his first degree is in English from the University of London but he's finishing up his master's in philosophy mm -hmm. at a you know online in a university in Rome but um, it's he's just a very he's thinker he's yeah. a very thinker person um, and so a lot of it is just kind of crafting um, you know he spent a lot of time just crafting a the thought process behind the arts um, yeah. I think in Christian music, uh, we struggle a lot because there's a lot of, um, oh, I don't know. I think there's just misinterpretations mm -hmm. of um, even Christian music, you know. Um, yeah. Christian is not an adjective. It's a noun. Mm -hmm. It's what I am. Right. Um, right. And That's a great way to put that. And so there's a, a difficulty. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, y'all have played lots of churches too and and I remember in the early days I, I there, you would always kind of have some preacher at the end of a show and he would have something to say like you know everybody this is in the days when nobody had tickets you know because yeah. you're just starting up and yeah. so it's y'all give them a good offering because you know they could be anywhere in the world doing this but they're doing it right here on our church stage for Jesus you know yeah you understand what he means yes. like in a big, in a big way, Absolutely. but in another way, there's this inference that if you were on a nice stage in a nice place, singing those same songs, you wouldn't be doing it for Jesus. Right. Yeah. You're only doing it for Jesus because you're on that little, you're in that yeah. building on mm. that stage. Right. And I struggled with that a lot because, sure. you know, I didn't, we didn't spend years of our life sacrificing all that we did to gain the skill that we gained yep. in order, you know, to be, to have it all minimized yes. by, by that kind of understanding, a philosophical understanding. Right. And so again, I'm grateful that God has given us a, a way of keeping the, allowing the breadth of what we do to expand while yeah. holding on to it like a depth of, of thought that helps us, you know, find satisfaction in what we're doing. Yeah. I think being skilled and trained as scripture says actually helps us build more bridges to people outside of the four walls of the church. Mm. You no, know, I think it gives us, for one thing, the arts are so elevated right now. Like the skill level is so high and what is expected of artists is so, so high that if you can't at least be able to speak that language to some degree, it's hard to garner the, the respect from people who need to hear the gospel, who need to hear about the love of Jesus, but they're not going to listen to us if we're, if we're not going to at least take the time to hone our craft, you know? Mm. I'm not saying that's true for every, everybody, but I just think having the tools in the tool, toolbox never hurts when we're trying to build, oh, stuff, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. I just think if, I, if I'm a tool in God's toolbox, I want to be a sharp one, you know? I don't yeah. want to, I, I don't want to be the one where I'm like, well, let's, let's, let's jump over that one, you know? I, <laughs> <there's> a, <laughs> I think that there's that fact that, you know, I love that scripture where David says, you know, I will not offer to the Lord that which cost me nothing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you know, if you, if you believe that what you're doing in your life is an offering to God, it means that you can't go through it without, um, without thought, you know, yeah. of just what you're offering. Now I do think that 
you know, y'all kind of come from a little bit more of a legit musical perspective, um, as do we, Mm -hmm. you know, I always really struggled going into, um, you know, commercial music because so many people are just, just ooze natural, you know, like natural talent, you know, Mm -hmm. and didn't necessarily study in the same way that I did. Right. And, And so there's another part of it where, um, you have to not let the kind of the el- the elitist view. Yeah, of- Ooh, <laughs> I could be a snob. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, and that's really you know that's a big yeah, deal. Sure. I mean, in the yeah. classical world, particularly. Um, mm-hmm. And so there's like this back and forth about saying, you know, if you are, it's not just about playing. It's about performing and it's about communicating and it's not just about communicating anything. It's about communicating what God wants you to communicate Mm. and what it's going to elevate people. And so it's, you know, it can't be either or it has to be and both. Yeah, for sure. Like I think we as a human, just in humanity in general struggle with both ends. (laughs) We like either ors. It's easy. Both ends are hard, you know? Yes. So in, in, in this, in this industry, it's so easy to, I find it very easy to mm-hmm. get caught up in the industry side of it, in the work side of it, the hustle side of it, the here's, here's the list of what has to be done in order to make sure that the work is done, bills are paid, all of that. Um, and I know I do find myself at times having to remind myself of why I got into it in the first place mm-hmm. or trying to seek out new sources of inspiration for why I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm curious to know, like, do you find yourself in that position? And if so, what are some of the things that you look to for inspiration or re-inspiration to keep you motivated in, in why you're doing this? Yes. So for, uh, yes, I do. I, I do find that that happens. Um, yeah. Well, you know, in, in the, the vision of the world, the work of being an artist is primarily just recording and playing a concert mm-hmm. and playing, okay. recording and playing a concert is it's the dessert of <laughs> the actual yeah, work, you do every sure. day, right? yes. which is, you know, we don't have to go into all of that because it's not, it's not the fun stuff of, <laughs> of life. Um, but it is, I think it is, I think it is hard to stay inspired. I think it's hard to stay inspired. I, I'm mostly inspired by other artists. Yeah. Mostly, you know, yeah. so, um, listening a lot. I am very, um, I love songwriters. I'm mm-hmm. not like on a musical level. The things that I enjoy listening to are primarily, um, around people that I consider to be great communicators and not even necessarily great singers right. or, or even the people that are the most impressive, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's probably the number one thing that I'm still working on, like chopping from my, my classical, you know, yeah. Yeah. Pain and ball right. is, is Same. the need to impress. Oh, Same. if you haven't impressed, then yes. yeah, have you done it? Have you done the job if they aren't impressed? Yes. Yeah. Whereas uh, kind of other genres, I think, are easier in that regard because they're not about impressing. You know, if you're a singer songwriter, it's not about impressing somebody. It's the about authenticity, being, right? It's about yes, exactly, authenticity and depth. And so, um, I tend to like those kinds of yeah, you know, those times kinds of artists. So I listen to a lot of singer songwriters, um, but I mostly just I really love collaborating with people. I, I get a lot of joy out of that. Um, you know, it's creating something is never a one. It's never an individual thing. Yeah. Um, even if you're an individual artist, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, again, I don't think people, your lay person that is not involved in the arts realizes that if you're an individual artist, it means that the whole process of crafting what is your music is a very much a team effort that... Right. Sure crafted by a whole group of people for sure so it's um sorry i'm back you're good Gretchen decided to call hey gretchen <laughs> um is there from from all the 
hats that you wear as as a singer, as a violinist, as a songwriter, um, as an educator, is there a certain aspect of what you do that energizes you the most, whether it's in rehearsal or in a studio or on a stage? Is there one thing? Stage. That yeah, I like stage. stage. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a stage. I'm a stage person. Yeah. I like recording too, um, but it's not. Um, but not the same as, yeah. yeah. It's hard to beat when you can see people respond mm -hmm. to what you're doing, yeah. you know, and it's, it's one of the best, best feelings in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do, I love rehearsal. Like, <laughs> I, I'm one of those strange people. I just love the process of taking something that's very raw, yeah. very, you know, un, unpolished and honing it in. Yeah. Something beautiful. Yeah. You know, I, well, it can be good. You know, like re rehearsal is one of those things where, well, it can go really great or it can go really badly. Yes, it can. <laughs> yes, it can. That's so true. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and so, you talk about collaborating. It depends on your other collaborators too. It does. You know, there are times when you're like, this is not working. Y'all, we should throw this out. It's <laughs> yeah. not good. Um, For sure. At least when, by the time you get to the concert, hopefully it's all been whittled down to just the gold, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I think I relate to that too, James. Like the, the rehearsal side of it for me is very energizing. And I, I relate it to, because um, I, I have kind of my side, my side hustle, if you will, as a designer and a visual artist. And oh, uh -huh. I've got a background in, in that world. And so I love the process of creating something mm -hmm. um, even though I might end up with some sort of work of art that I can frame looking at it yes brings me joy but remembering the process of creating it that developed I, I have there are certain things that I have created whether it's musical or visual that I have an emotional attachment to that mm -hmm. because I spent so much time doing a deep dive into myself and my own thoughts and emotions and all that and giving of myself into this thing and so that happens in rehearsals as well and you're whittling it down and you're sanding out all the rough patches and then ultimately the performance is the final product but for me a lot of the energy comes from the joy of doing all the whittling the process yeah 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 i i tend to be um and this is part of my classical training mm -hmm. i tend to be very meticulous and very almost a perfectionist. Like I, I'm a recovering perfectionist for sure. <laughs> and I'm also learning that my perfectionism really limits my musical offering at times yeah. because I'm mm -hmm. so up here yeah. in my head. And I'm so concentrated on every note resonating perfectly and being pronounced perfectly and all of that. Sometimes it's just, oh, just to let go and just sing sometimes would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Do you ever struggle with that? I mean. Um, yeah, I mean, I do. I see other artists, you know, it's like, here I am, I'm in my bedroom and my guitar and I've got piles of dirty clothes everywhere around me and, but it looks and sounds amazing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I could just never do that. <laughs> like I, I'm just a lot more, um, I'm not that degree of just transparency, probably. Yeah. Um, now, that doesn't mean that I'm not real with people, but it just sure. means that everybody kind of draws that line somewhere. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's something for me. Now, one thing that you will find funny, James, uh, is that uh, my mother has done a lot of studying into singing, right? Mm -hmm. So singing um, is really a unique kind of miraculous activity that it's yeah. one of the only things that we do naturally that uses both sides of our brain. Yeah. yeah. So it uses both sides of our brain and it also releases um, the, the love hormone oxytocin, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So it floods our body with oxytocin. However, uh, for people who have not studied singing, singing fires up the, the pleasure, fun, like party yes. spot of your brain. Mm -hmm. But yes. for people who have studied singing, it fires up the nervous, it fires up the, um, Hang on. It fires up the nervous, anxious part mm. of your brain. Woo. So there's a whole part of like anxiety that gets associated with um, 
singing as a singer, you know, <laughs> that isn't necessarily true of your yeah. just, you know, hairbrush singer. Yep. That just finds a great joy in singing. Sometimes I'm so and, jealous of those people. I know. <laughs> just, what I'm I would like, give to just go oh, sing karaoke and not think twice about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometime we'll all go out and we'll all go sing karaoke you, and not think twice about it. Oh my gosh. You know what sounds fun to me singing? Doing it really well. <laughs> <laughs> like that fires up the fun in my brain what sounds fun to me is not being bad yeah <laughs> totally. <laughs> that was an awesome interview um many of you know i also am in education so i loved hearing about um the school of music that they have and yeah. how annie and the annie moses band they all are super invested in training the next generation of musicians yeah, for sure and obviously training them up musically but also spiritually and philosophically and just you know regarding uh why they make the music they make mm -hmm. and make sure they do it really well too yeah so. absolutely and i love that even though they are so philosophically oriented and they know why they do what they do um, it doesn't stifle the music they create in fact it just gives them the opportunity for even more uh, freedom of expression and, and that's very obvious in the music and I love that about the Annie Moses band um, But yeah, that was a that was a lot of fun getting Great. to talk with Annie um, Hey, we hope you guys enjoyed this. We hope you enjoy all these Veritox um, If you want more of this content uh, go check out our patreon. We've got some exclusive uh, bonus footage from all the Veritox episodes uh, you get early access to all of them um, as well as some even one-on-one -on -one interviews that yep. some of the guys do um, that we have on there as well. So go check us out on Patreon. You can support us there uh, to get a lot of exclusive footage. Of course, you can always follow us on social media at Veritas5 and keep up with us there. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this, and we'll see you next week on Veritox. And here is to your next big idea. Ta-da! <laughs>